Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, we were just listening to um, Pomp and Circumstance conducted by Patrick Thomas and the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. So it was a fantastic recording. Thank you. I'm Kate Bell, events producer here at the State Library. Firstly, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to the ancestors who came before them. And um, tonight we are really proud to present Classical Queensland and to talk as part of our Deep in the Conversation series, which is a diverse program of talks, debates and conversations with leading thinkers and artists to, to stimulate and share ideas. Tonight's talk is a celebration of the rich history of classical music in Queensland. And it was inspired by Dr. Martin Buzzacott's research and documentation of the people and events that have shaped Queensland's classical musical history. In 2007, uh, Martin was the recipient of the John Oxley Library Fellowship, which is a $20,000 fellowship, which allowed Martin to access the, the resources here at the State Library for research into his new book, which I'm sure he'll tell you more about. So tonight, Martin will be in conversation with Patrick Thomas and Pamela Page, who have both made an enormous contribution to fine music in Queensland. And we're very pleased to welcome them here tonight. Just give you a brief introduction to, to Patrick and Pamela, who I'm sure you, you all know. Patrick Thomas is a noted or orchestral and opera conductor. He made his first ABC broadcast as a flautist in Brisbane at the age of 12. His subsequent career in the performing arts has extended over 60 years, and for much of that time, a familiar figure on Australia's national music scene, where he's conducted many hundreds of concerts. For 22 years, he held directional appointments with no fewer than four ABC orchestras and the ABC's radio chorus, finally being appointed the ABC's federal conductor in residence. He's also appeared in many countries overseas as a guest conductor, which are too numerous to name. Pamela Page won an Empire Overseas Scholarship to study at Trinity College in London, where she was awarded the Maud Seaton Prize for the Most Outstanding Student. She later performed on BBC Radio and TV, gave solo and concerto performances in London and the English counties. Having tied for first place with Max Olding in the inaugural Royal Concert Trust Fund competition, they formed a two-piano team and subsequently married in Vienna. Back in Australia, she gave many performances in all capital cities, recitals on ABC Radio, live TV appearances, and also hosted a TV children's show. Uh, so... Tonight, we, the conversation's going to go um, for about an hour and a half, and um, there'll be time at the, the end for questions as well. We're also, just so you know, recording the talk, um, and it'll be available on our website. So if you have any questions about that, please let me know. Um, and so please uh, join with me to make Martin and Patrick and Pamela very welcome. Thank you very much, Kate, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Pamela. Good evening, Max. Um, good evening to you all. It's really great to see so many important Queensland musicians in the audience uh, as well tonight. Um, can I just acknowledge Max Olding, who's in the, in the audience as well. I see Rodney Jacobson is here. I see Jeanette Manrix is here. I'm sure there are several others up there. I can't quite see that far. Pardon my vision. Uh, but it's, it's really exciting to be here to... to Really, I suppose, just, just go through a very, very small part of Queensland musical history because if we were to, if we were to cover the whole of Queensland musical history, of course, we'd be covering 50,000 years of music making in 90 minutes. Um, as it is, I think um, it's, it's, it's quite hard to know exactly where to, where to start. I'd probably start by asking Kate to come up and actually get the toolbar on the bottom of this uh, computer. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, you know, the, the history of, of Queensland music making in terms of the classical European tradition, thanks, starts with this man. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, this man, R.T. Jeffries, and I could really start by talking about him. I'm not going to except simply to acknowledge him, really, uh, because R.T. R. Jeffries was really the first classical musician of some distinction to come to Queensland. And he came to Queensland in 1871. He'd been a member of several of the London orchestras. He was a violinist mainly, but he was actually a multi-instrumentalist. And uh, he came here not to become a musician. He came here as an, as an, an immigrant uh, to become a farmer in the Lockyer Valley. And uh, that lasted about six weeks. Um, and he, at the beginning of 1872, he found himself in Brisbane and he, um, um, his family, the, the, the family that he began here in Brisbane became the Jeffreys, members of the Jeffreys String Quartet, 
who for in, the second, in the second half of the 19th century were one of the major ensembles. Vada Jeffries there, the violinist, is, um, was to become an institution in Queensland musical life. She uh, led her own string orchestra well into the 19, 1930s um, and there are still students alive today of Vada Jeffries. Um, I don't want to concentrate on that though um, except to say that, that um, R.T. Jeffries was also a composer at the turn of the century, of course, there was a great amount of patriotic fervour around the place. And, um, and Jeffries, like several other composers of the time, time, wrote lots of patriotic anthems. Here's one of them. And uh, just as a bit of a plug to, to, state, to the State Library Services, you can actually, actually access this music online. All you have to do is go to the Music Queensland website and you can actually stream this particular, this particular uh, tune or at least I think you can. Just bear with me. There we are. Here we go. This is what R.T. Jeffrey's music sounded like. It sounded a bit louder than that. Maker of earth and sea, what shall we Get the gist. And virgin gold. That's Jason Barry Smith, by the way, who's just recorded that. This is part of this amazing uh, Music Queensland website where you can access all kinds of, of historical documents and performances of Queensland, Queensland music. It's quite extraordinary. Um, but um, beyond, beyond R.T. Jeffries, there were a number of other really important Queensland musicians around the latter part of the 19th century. One of them was a young woman who looked like this. She, at the time, in the 1880s, she was in her early 20s and she was a cane farmer's wife, about 10, living about 10 miles west of Mackay. She would, of course, in time become the most powerful, not just the most powerful performer, not just the most powerful woman, but indeed the most powerful person in Australian music. She is, of course, Nellie Melba. Nellie, of course, was not a great fan of Queensland, <laughs> but, uh, but you can still actually visit the house where, where she lived for about five years in the, in the early 1880s up in uh, just west of Mackay. Um, the other great figure of that period was George Sampson, and uh, his influence on Queensland music making is still in existence today with the Sampson Music Library still being a source of music for, for professional musicians throughout the state. Uh, Samson came here in 1898. He was an organist. He became organist of St John's Cathedral, but he too was a multi-instrumentalist. And basically anything that happened in, uh, in Brisbane in particular, in Brisbane music making between 1898 and the 1930s, was usually because of George Sampson, whether it was orchestras, whether it was choral music, whether it was organ and church music. Um, he was a hugely influential person. But I'm not even going to talk about him tonight. Um, there's a caricature of him. Um, he too was a composer. These are all starting points where I could have started the talk. I could have started the talk with this man as well, Louis de Hage, who was actually a personal friend of the Strauss family, who, um, who actually ran the Rockhampton Orpheus Orchestra for many, many years. And for a time, it was actually one of the finest orchestras in Australia. It was only a small orchestra, 22 players, for the bulk of its, its career. But Rockhampton was actually a thriving orchestral centre in the early part of the 20th century century and mainly because of Louis de Hage, a very important musician. I could also start the talk in the 1930s, specifically in 1932 when the ABC was established and the ABC's charter said that it was to create permanent groups of musicians for the purpose of rendering orchestral music in Australia. And these were the three men who were charged with that uh, important duty. Uh, the man on the left is a young Sir Bernard Hines, Bernard Hines as he was then. The man in the mid middle is William James Cleary, who was an inspirational and self-made man 
who was the first chairman of note of the ABC. He came in just a few months after the establishment of the ABC. And the man on the right was Charles, later Sir Charles Moses, who became an institution with the ABC. All three of them, well, obviously Sir Bernard was a great music lover, but the other two were also profound lovers of music. And uh, their vision and drive actually created the orchestral environment in Australia, which we know today. Um, but I don't want to start there either. I don't want to start with all the great artists who they brought to Australia, like Percy Granger. Percy Granger actually performed quite a bit in Queensland. Um, he toured with the ABC military band. He performed with what is now known as the Queensland State, or, or was for so many years known as the Queensland State and Municipal Choir. He was one of the high-profile visitors here. Sir Malcolm Sargent uh, came here three times to conduct what was a 17-member ABC uh, Brisbane Orchestra, augmented by a number of other players. He came in 1936, 1938, 1939. This is a wonderful shot. This is one of my favourite shots from the research I've been doing. As you can see from the watermark, this is from the ABC archives in Sydney. But this, the man on the left is Arthur Rubenstein, the great pianist. The man on the right is Georg Schneevoit, Sibelius's best friend, and the person to whom the sixth, who gave the premiere of Sibelius's Sixth Symphony. And that photograph is taken backstage at the Brisbane City Hall. They played here and out uh, together in, uh, 1930, uh, in 1939. And uh, there were just two of the very high profile artists who came to Brisbane in the pre-war years. But I don't want to start there either because we'd be here all night. I want to start here. At this moment, some of you have probably seen this image in the publicity for tonight's talk. The conductor there is, is Eugene Ormandy and that's Brisbane City Hall. The date was the 12th of August, 1944. This was an immensely important occasion in the history of Queensland music making. Why? Because there's an American there. Let me try to explain. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Eugene Ormandy and why I speak about him in such hushed tones, and most musicians do. He was actually a Hungarian by birth. He was born in 1899, but he emigrated to America in... Uh, in uh, when did he, he was 21 when he emigrated to America, so it would have been 1920. Um, and he took his name, his name was Jano Blau, uh, but he actually took his name, Eugene Ormandy, from the name of the ship that he emigrated on. And he sailed across the, the Atlantic on. And um, he came to prominence first with the Minneapolis Symphony in 1931, turned them into one of the most recorded orchestras in the world. And he specialised in this really ambitious repertoire, Bruckner's Seventh Symphony and Mahler's Second Symphony and works like that. But then in 1936, he went to Philadelphia, to the Philadelphia Orchestra as Stokowski's assistant. And uh, two years later, 1938, he ascended into the top job. And then over the next 40 years, he became an absolute legend. Recordings of the Philadelphia Orchestra under Eugene Ormandy are still all over in current circulation all over the world uh, today. He really was a major, major player. And, uh, and so when the ABC um, received word that Ormandy may be able to tour, may be available to tour Australia in 1944 under the joint auspices of the ABC and the Office of War Information, Charles Moses, the, the general manager of the ABC, just couldn't believe, couldn't believe his luck. But the problem was a logistical one. How do you transport the conductor across the war ravaged Pacific Ocean? Because the, all the air corridors were effectively shut down to the civilian aircraft. Shipping was too slow because he only had a limited time frame. So Moses, went, in his typical manner, went straight to General Blamey, the head of the Australian Armed Forces, who he knew personally because Moses had been a soldier himself. And he, he sent a telegram saying that he wanted, he wanted the army to support... Uh, to support this tour. And in the telegram, he said something very prophetic. He said in telegram speak, would be outstanding event in Australian musical history. Well, it certainly, it certainly proved, proved to be exactly that. Um, right from the outset, it was clear that this was going to be no ordinary tour. Wherever he went, he went, Ormandy just proved an absolute sensation. Literally thousands of people both people from military life but also civilians attended his concerts. It was an incredibly democratic kind of, kind of audience who actually attended these, these concerts. And everywhere, like everywhere else in Australia, in Brisbane, Ormandy created a sensation, 
particularly so because bear in mind that this was a tour organised by the by the the army, effectively. Um, and of course, in Brisbane in 1944, that was wartime Brisbane. General MacArthur had his had the command here. He had the Pacific Command here, based at Lennon's Hotel in Brisbane. There were soldiers all over the place. Ormandy used his press appearances in, in the city to, to speak of the unbelievable musical appreciation that he'd, he'd experienced in Australia, and he said, you are more than ready for a major orchestra in every city. And he said that at the press conference before his first, his first rehearsal with, the Queensland, with what was the ABC's Brisbane Orchestra, augmented by, uh, by players from down south. I think the orchestra was led by Leslie Chester from down south. I think, oh no, Hayden Beck from from uh, down south. We uh, we had Neville Amadio, the great flute player. He flew in for the concert, and uh, you might even actually see him playing the flute. No, you, you can't. Neville actually went AWOL to play this concert, and he, so just in case he got into trouble, he actually played the concert wearing his wearing his military military uniform. There were four concerts in all that were staged here at Brisbane City Hall on the 12th of August. Two were for the troops, as you can see there, the troops in their uniforms, and two were for the general public. In the audience for one of the two general public concerts was a 12-year-old Brisbane boy who had ambitions of becoming a flute player. He looked something like this in later life. We came to know him as the dynamic conductor of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, our first homegrown chief conductor, Patrick Thomas. And Patrick was there that night when Ormandy played. Can you recall it, Patrick? What was it like? This concert was absolutely, it triggered what had been an interest in becoming a conductor into a passion, I hate to say it, but an obsession as well. It was sensational. People were galvanised in the Brisbane City Hall. I think it probably would have been the largest orchestra that had performed on the stage of our City Hall here. And um, as you rightly say, there, were, there was a stiffening of uh, southern players including Neville and uh, Hayden Beck, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, there, was, there were, I do remember, there were military personnel in the audience as well, as well as um, citizens. And there was a standing ovation at the end. And uh, I went home just absolutely gobsmacked. I really was. And um, I wrote, I was so fired up when I knew Ormandy was coming out to Australia that I had the temerity, the audacity, <laughs> to write to the ABC and ask for... <laughs> Ormandy's autograph. And back it came a week later. <laughs> he actually did sign the autograph for him, yeah. for the 12-year-old kid. An incredible yeah. experience it was. And uh, it was a turning point for me. I was, I was determined from that point, I can assure you, that I had to do this. You know, I had to become a conductor myself. It was a turning point for you as well, as I think for so many people in Australia, one of whom was already, by 1944... <laughs> A broadcaster of six years' experience as a pianist. She was, at the time of that Ormandy tour, ten years old only. She'd made her debut as a pianist on the ABC at the age of four, and her name was Pamela Page. <laughs> Pamela, how does a four-year-old get a gig with the ABC? <laughs> well, it was, it was very strange. Um, I don't remember very much about it, of course, but... Um, uh, I was, uh, my grandmother fortunately kept something. A telegram arrived, and the address on the telegram was Pamela Page, pianist, age four. That's all it was. <laughs> and then inside, I, I tried to look it up last night because um, we're not very organised, and I just pulled out a suitcase and rummaged through to see if I could find if my grandmother had kept the telegram, and she had. And it um, was, I had, to, well, someone had to connect with Kirk. Whoever Kirk was. Basil and Kirk was the New South Wales manager of the ABC. <laughs> so I think they must have seen um, my appearance on Cinesound Newsreel when I was four. They, um, that, 
that was sort of going around Sydney, so I must have been well known then. But it was very nice of the ABC to want to have me to play something. I, I would have played only by ear. I wasn't taught. I was mm. playing from two things by ear and compositions. So uh, a pity. I don't know whether they, they probably wouldn't have recorded <laughs> in those days. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. It's one of the great tragedies of Australian cultural life that almost the entire record of those early recordings, the, almost all of them have gone missing. Yes, they've gone missing. Or been destroyed or, That's right. or in some cases not, sunk, literally. Uh, Maybe not ocean. recorded even. I don't, mm. I, this I wouldn't know. So I've been on the books for 70 mm. years now <laughs> on the ABC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> yes, it's, it's a very impressive track record. <laughs> uh, so you, uh, and as, as you suggest, you, you, you blossomed into into one of the Australia's great pianists. And I have to say one of the most glamorous as well, based on that, on, on that photograph. I don't remember that. Men all over the country were swept off, the, off their feet by Pamela's beauty. Here's one who was. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously it would take quite something to, to win, a, win the heart of that glamorous young woman. And <laughs> an open top convertible clearly was the thing that was required. <laughs> I've never seen that. <laughs> Max Olding, who was the 1952 winner of the ABC's Concerto and Vocal, or Instrumental and Vocal, as it was called, in competition. Fellow pianist, and as Kate said in the introduction tonight, um, they became not just husband and wife, but of course piano duo partners, and very happy Max is, in, Max is with us in the audience uh, tonight, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be hearing from him um, in, a, in a moment. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh yes. I was pregnant there when that photo was taken. Really? <laughs> yes. I was fatter in the face. <laughs> One of the things about this Ormandy tour, just to get back to the Ormandy tour, was um, even though there were so many troops in the audience, you'd think they were kind of, you know, rough hew, they were rough hew, you know, individuals, you know, weren't necessarily classical music lovers. But the Courier Mail covered these concerts as they covered all these, all these major events in music over, over the decades. And uh, the report was that at the end of each number, there was an eloquent buzz of respect. And during the playing, the quietness of the troops was as decorous, was as, decorous as that of any civilian audience. Not one of them went to the city hall yesterday to have a seat, a backrest, and a sleep for a couple of hours. That probably was the real phenomenon of the concert. There were people queued out into what we now call King George Square. It was, it was overflowing for every, every one of these concerts. And Ormandy himself was deeply moved by the experience. At the end of one of the performances, he told the orchestra, this is our Brisbane orchestra, that apart from a few minor flaws, they had played Beethoven's Seventh Symphony as well as any orchestra under the baton of Toscanini. For the musicians who heard him speak in this way and for the administrators who, frankly, had endured decades of jibes from visiting conductors about the standard of our orchestras here in Australia and, and how inadequate they were, this was an absolutely inspirational moment. And, um, and the thing about it was, I suppose, that the sheer popularity of Orm Ormandy's concerts here, it wasn't exactly exceptional in itself because prior to his appearance, you know, we'd had Sir Malcolm Sargent, we'd had Sir Thomas Beecham, we'd had Sir Bernard Hines visiting regularly, annually, and they'd all encountered profound enthusiasm. But what was different with Ormandy was, was that now there wasn't so much a sense of this being some kind of one-off event, this magical moment where somehow this ragtag band of musicians had come together and had, had played out of, out of their skins. It, rather, it, it seemed like something a lot more substantial. It seemed like the beginning of something. Uh, uh, it was a successful moment, of course, but it, but it was more a pointer to an Australian orchestral future uh, built on ongoing excellence. And, uh, and of course, the Australia that, that Ormandy came to was, was becoming a very different place. You know, we were having, we were having more migrants who were, who were coming, uh, for instance. And we, uh, many of them with the sounds of the Vienna Philharmonic or the Berlin Philharmonic ringing in their, ringing in their ears. The ABC itself had educated an entire generation since 1932, or at least half a generation, to, to the wonders of music. We had Neville Carter's here broadcasting every week these inspirational programs inspiring a love of, of music. The culture was changing. Even within the army itself, the army itself had a, a really important music education program. All of which is to say that, that by, toward the end of the war, when Ormandy was, was here, 
Something was happening in Australian music. And Ormandy was about halfway through his tour when he sent a report to the acting Prime Minister, Frank Ford, July 1944, just before he came to Brisbane. And in it, he actually set out a vision for an orchestral future in Australia. The ABC couldn't sustain full symphony orchestras in their own right. They were just too expensive. What Ormandy proposed in that report, which still exists, it's still in the National Archives, typewritten, extraordinary document. In it, he actually said that there should be a tripartite agreement in every state capital between symphony orchestras, oh, the, sorry, the, the ABC, um, the state government, and the local city council to create a permanent symphony orchestra in each state. And in conclusion, he wrote, I'm convinced that this great country is on the threshold of musical and artistic developments which few Australians dare even visualise. But fortunately, there were people within the ABC who did dare to visualise that, and one of them was, was Charles, Sir, later Sir Charles Moses, who got the ball rolling immediately. He circulated Ormandy's comments to the major Australian governments and councils, and with that document in hand, all that lobbying began. And by war's end... Just 12 months later, um, Ormandy's report was generally accepted as the blueprint for an Australian orchestral future. And it was one of Charles Moses's finest, finest hours. And he proved himself an indefatigable and ultimately very successful um, champion of this orchestral dream in Australia. So that was 1944, but, and, and Moses then got the ball rolling through to about 1946. And in 1946... <coughs> I'll go past the Bernard Hines, that's just another one of the Bernard in action. In 1946, another major landmark in Australian musical history. This is all related to Queensland, as we'll discover, but in 1946, this man came to Australia. His name was Eugene Goosens. He was the man who had conducted the London premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring in front of a booing, cheering, near delirious audience which also included the composer himself, who was a personal friend. This man was musical royalty. He uh, came from three generations of musicians, and he made his first Australian tour in 1946. He is, of course, now synonymous with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, of whom he became chief conductor in 1947. But a little-known fact is that Eugene... Uh, sorry, not Eugene Ormandy, that uh, Eugene Goosens made his Australian debut in Brisbane. He made his debut here in May 1946. He flew in, touched down out at Eagle Farm Airport, four-engine plane, and the, and, and the Courier Mail was there to meet him. The, the Brisbane Telegraph, most of you will remember the afternoon, Brisbane Telegraph, uh, they were there to meet him. And it was the start of an Australian love affair with this, with this conductor. But he was here to make his Australian concert debut in Brisbane. The expectation was immense for this man conducting what was still the Brisbane Symphony Orchestra. We didn't have a QSO at that point. And a member of the orchestra on that night when Goosens played was again Patrick Thomas, who at 14 years of age... Were Patrick, were you second or third flute? Um, about fifth, I think, at that point. <laughs> uh, third, In actually. short pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what was that experience like, playing for such a, well, a great well, musician? Well, once again, it was um, as if I was at the feet of God. Uh, Goosens was... Uh, he had a foot in both camps. He was a composer, a brilliant composer, and a conductor who was... Um, he had an extraordinary repertoire that went, in, as you say, into the contemporary sphere, very definitely. And um, he drew some wonderful performances out of this orchestra here, too, in, in Brisbane. Yes. And in particularly that night. Yes. I think the French horns had a, a few fuzzy moments in the handle water music suite. <laughs> but that's history, isn't it? Was everyone nervous? Yes, everyone was, including the fifth flute. <laughs> <laughs> you were supposed to be nervous. You were only 14 years old. It must have been terrifying. <laughs> it was my 14th birthday. That's some 14th birthday. Yeah. Yes, I was, I've never forgotten it. Another, another one of those, you know. I can't think of many forgotten. musicians who could say on their 14th birthday they played a full symphonic concert under Sir Eugene Gerson's. <laughs> That's ridiculous, isn't it? 
Someone else who uh, someone else who played under Eugene Gerson. I just mentioned that Max Olding won the 1952 instrumental and vocal competition with the AB, uh, for the ABC. The conductor on his concerto performance in that in that um, in that competition was in fact Eugene Goosens. Um, Max, I wonder if you could. Um, Max is sitting here in the front row. What was Goosens like as a conductor? <coughs> Tyrannical. Tyrannical. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he virtually ruled the orchestra, the Sydney Symphony, with a rod of iron, but not in a so much of a tempestuous way, but in an autocratic way, which was just characteristic of his personality. Uh, so Eugene um, was an inspiration to work with, uh, and I very clearly remember the dress rehearsal for the, uh, the at that time when I was the winner of the, um, subsequently the winner of the uh, ABC na uh, national competition. That was the grand final in Sydney. We had previously had the, the, uh, the final in each state and each of the state winners in those days was invited to play at the grand final, either Sydney or Melbourne or whatever, and this was in Sydney. And at the final rehearsal, um, he said something to the effect of my boy, I think we will take the last variation faster. <laughs> just, what, uh, this, just what you want to hear. The work, the work as you, as, uh, yes, was the Rachmaninoff uh, variations on a theme of Paganini, the well-known A minor caprice. And that last variation is a bit fiendish for the pianist. And I thought I was doing quite okay. And uh, so, but he apparently saw the potential. He had that vision of uh, and being able to detect something which was probably a bit latent in one's personality and was able to extract it by saying simply that, I think we take it just a bit faster. <laughs> I thought, my crikey. Uh, uh. <laughs> and and the, the, the amazing thing to me, I was quite astonished that I could do it because of this inspirational moment that he just injected into me. And it, it felt swimmingly. And... Um, the comment of one of the, my, my um, competitor friends who was in the same competition after the event, he said, you play differently tonight uh, than you did at the rehearsal. And I said, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it was probably due to the fact that this inspirational man was there. Yes. And I think if, in the same breath, if I may, Martin, mm -hmm. uh, th there are a few conductors who inspire you like that. And in our presence tonight, we have Patrick Thomas. Now, Patrick was a person that, with whom Pam and I have played a number of times. And he was the person one felt absolutely at home with when you had a concerto to play. Because number one, he did his homework. Number two, he was inspirational as a conductor because he heard every single note that you play and was right on your hammer all the time. There was never any doubt about it in terms of ensemble, to me anyway. Mm. Mm. And I'm sure Pam would echo those sentiments. So I thank you in public, Patrick Thomas, yes. for those moments of joy and great privilege to work with you as it was, of course, with the master on the screen. So thank you once thank again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And of course, Pam uh, knew Eugene Goosens in the, in the sense that at the time he was director of the Conservatorium of Music in New South Wales, she had, uh, uh, she had audience with him and played for him, and also he gave her a marvellous reference before she went overseas. So, Do you remember what it said? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but uh, I, I remember sort of being absolutely terrified of this great yes. Eugene Goosens. <laughs> yes. The stories, the stories Max tells of, of Goosens are common around the, around the country. In Perth, he arrived in Perth where the orchestra had a terribly low reputation. After the first rehearsal, he said, he said to them, so they were just playing a, a fairly simple program as befitted their, their status as a modestly credentialed or orchestra. After the first rehearsal, he said, let's do Firebird of Stravinsky. I think you're up to it. And it was this inspirational moment. And, and Vaughan Hanley, the former concertmaster of the Wasso, still talks about it. Age 94, he says that was one of the greatest moments of his career. And they sent across to, to um, New South Wales to get the parts, and they sent them across in time for the next day, put them on a plane, brought them across, and Wasso played Firebird.
with, uh, with Goosens. He was that kind of man. And, and even now, people speak in hushed tones about, about Eugene Goosens as an inspiring person. When he was in Brisbane on that first tour, what he did, he spoke in public and he spoke about the need for, for, for cultural development, cultural adventurism, and specifically he spoke about the need, he threw his weight behind the concept of a permanent, full-size symphony orchestra to be established here in Brisbane. And he told the press that a community which is in possession of a fine orchestra and a first-rate conductor could consider itself thoroughly blessed. Well, in the following year, he went on to become Australia's first major resident orchestral conductor, and his work with the Sydney Symphony is, of course, well known. The Sydney Symphony started in that year, 1946, Goosens took them over in 1940, 1947. But in that time, in that very month, when Goosens was here in Brisbane starting his decade-long Australian career, behind the scenes, the Queensland manager of the ABC, ABC A.N. Huck Finlay, was hard at work setting up the framework that would help us to establish what was to become the second permanent symphony orchestra in Australia, the second after Sydney, and that was the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Huck Finlay was a wonderful man. He was um, he's a former rugby international. In fact, just recently I saw on a, on a list of all-time Wallaby greats, he was listed as one of the four or five locks. Uh, the greatest ever to play for Australia. He played 12 tests for Australia. A lot of the ABC people were sportsmen. Charles Moses was, a, was the Victorian heavyweight boxing champion. Um, he was president of the New South Wales Amateur Athletic Association for decades. Um, a lot of them were, were sportsmen. Huck Finlay was certainly that. When he went to work to establish this orchestra, he was, um, he'd just come out of Changi. Uh, he'd suffered the most horrendous deprivations. <laughs> And he could never live in ho he could never travel for the ABC again because he couldn't stand hotel rooms, the confined space of hotel rooms. But a lot of the ABC people at this time were people who'd endured the horrors of war, and Huck Finlay was certainly that. But he set about creating this orchestra, getting the blueprint together, using Ormandy's model as the blueprint. It was based as well, of course, on the Sydney Symphony, uh, Sydney Symphony model. Uh, Huck Finlay wasn't there to see it realised because Moses headhunted him and took him down to Sydney to uh, become his assistant general, general manager down there where he had a, had a stellar career. But he got, he got the ball rolling. Throughout the second half of 1946, in other words, immediately following Gerson's tour, speculation about the establishment of a permanent full-size symphony orchestra to, su to succeed this pro-am kind of ABC um, Brisbane orchestra excited the letter writers to the Courier Mail and the Telegraph. Everyone was talking about it. It was going to happen. Queensland was going to get a symphony orchestra. It was named the Brisbane Symphony Orchestra in all the initial discussions, but then the state government stepped in, and you can see in later drafts of the document, uh, it turned into the Queensland, or the Queensland Symphony Orchestra uh, in order to please the minister and the Queensland government who felt that it better reflected uh, statewide funding, effectively. Uh, of it. And on the 8th of January 1947, the Telegraph publicly announced the formation of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. And two days later, they signed up Leslie Chester as the first concertmaster. It was a very, very important moment. But while Leslie Chester's signing with the Premier there and the Mayor, the Lord Mayor there, while that dominated the headlines. Behind, the, behind all the headlines, there was still a huge amount of work to be done, and not the least of which was getting this three-way partnership between the ABC, federal government, the state government of Queensland, and the Brisbane City Council, getting that agreement to become a reality. In all of these planning discussions, the orchestra was to comprise a, minim, comprise a minimum of 45 and a maximum of 55 players enough to play the standard classical repertoire. And they were to be based at a studio in South Brisbane, which was to be rented from the Brisbane City Council at one quid per day. <laughs> to justify the funding which the orchestra was receiving, they were initially required to play 42 concerts annually. And meanwhile, despite Leslie Chester's signing, he was really the only person who'd been signed at the beginning of 1947. So auditions for the permanent players uh, were held. 
all around the six Australian states. It's not entirely clear just how many people auditioned, um, but um, it seems like it may only have been as few as 100. <laughs> Amazing. Amazingly. The Sydney Symphony had picked off the best of them, of course, or many of the best of them the previous year. Um, many musicians, of course, hadn't yet returned. They hadn't been demobbed after, after war service. And Brisbane at the time wasn't exactly a musical mecca that would, that would attract musicians, least of all because of the stinking hot playing conditions for much of the year here. We only got air conditioning here in, the, in 1977 in the rehearsal rooms of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. You can imagine how oppressive it must have been. Um, actually, Patrick, you played in, in those stinking hot rehearsal rooms, didn't you? Yes, I can remember. And uh, Andre Navarra, the uh, distinguished French cellist, we did uh, some, some, some subscription concerts when the orchestra was in uh, the old Theatre Royal in Elizabeth Street in about 1971 or 72, this was. And he was doing the Dvorak, and everyone was perspiring. Um, and I looked at him, and he was, he was so... It was, you know, that sort of... He felt... He felt it was an impossible situation. He said, the Dvorak is hard enough, but this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and he must have felt very relieved when he got back to Paris because this, the Queensland summer can be absolutely atrocious, you know. So, so it was 30 years of rehearsing in those kind of mm, conditions before right. air conditioning absolutely. at the Ferry Road Studios. Absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, and, of course, you can imagine what that does to instruments as well, how hard it is to keep instruments in tune. In he was those. sliding all over the fingerboard. It was... Mm. And uh, it wasn't just the humidity, of course, in the rehearsal rooms, because nowadays, of course, we'd never dream of this, but players smoked during the rehearsals as well. Yeah. Absolutely. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a hospital in, in uh, anticipation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, look, the result of all of this was that after, after the auditions, there were 42 players selected from Queensland. Mm. which was something to be really proud of in one way. In another way, it's sort of something to be a bit alarmed about, given that we didn't at that point have a conservatorium here. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly a lot, of the, a lot of the musicians who visited agitated for, for a conservatorium to be built. I just yeah. add, mm. add one very brief thing. Mm. At Brisbane in the 1940s, mm. it had its own cultural balance sheet compared to the other states and, and capital cities. But what Brisbane did have in 1946 and 47, string quartets from 1944 to 52, mm. state string quartets that toured extensively throughout, that was a plus, surely. Mm. Mm. It, had, it had, as you say, the second only to Sydney Symphony Orchestra. It had a state opera scheme, they, which handed out um, scholarships for promising singers. It took singers such as Margaret Elkins and Donald Smith on tour throughout the country centres as well. There were things going on. And, but above all, I must say that the Brisbane City Council was the, probably the most active mm. municipal body Absolutely. culturally in the whole country. Civic concerts, organ mm. recitals. Robert Bowden must have played hundreds of those mm. every Thursday, mm. religiously at, at 1 o'clock or 12.30 or something. And the, this was the, these were the pluses that Brisbane had. Mm. We hear a lot about the minuses, mm. but the... The fact is that it was a, you know, a flourishing cultural... And the result of it was yeah. this. This was the first Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Patrick, are you in that picture? I think, is that you on the left there in the flutes? Oh, gosh. Yes, I think it does. I think that's you. I don't know. I think that, yes. I haven't yeah. seen myself so... <laughs> yeah. that, so many that's, you, that's you sitting there. <laughs> this, was an ama this was an amazing thing to have a full-time permanent symphony orchestra mm. in, this, in this state. It was a source of huge national pride, or, or rather state, statewide pride. And in their first concert season, 1947, get a load of this. These are the guest artists who appeared with this orchestra. Raphael Kubelik, the conductor, Warwick Braithwaite, Eugene Goosens, violinists Isaac Stern and Willem Noski, and pianists Lily Krauss and Claudio Arau. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. An artistic administrator of the Queensland Orchestra these days would kill to have half of those names in, in a season, much less you know, all, all of them. The first concert was on 26th of March, 1947, under Percy, Percy Code, and... Um, 
The soloist that day was Eunice Gardner. The next, and about 1,600, 1,650 people showed up for that concert. But Percy Code, who was a kind of a staff conductor for the, AB, for the ABC, he, he rehearsed the orchestra for about three weeks before that concert. It paid off. It was a very good concert. Um, but the next week, the first chief conductor of the Queensland Orchestra showed up, and his name was John Farnsworth Hall. The previous week in the first concert, there had been over 1,600 people. For the first concert of John Farnsworth Hall, there were 261 the next week, it wasn't a very auspicious um, debut, but John Farnsworth Hall was to prove an absolute stalwart. He was, <clears throat> he'd been a member of the London orchestras. I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that um, famous recording that the 16-year-old Yehudi Menuhin uh, uh, made with uh, Sir El Edward Elgar conducting in Elgar's cello concerto. It's a, it's a legendary recording from 1934. And, uh, well, Farnsworth Hall was uh, on the front desk of the violins that day in that, in that recording. He came with that, with, uh, from that, that, great British, that great British tradition and he was to stay with us until 1954. And Patrick, you played under him regularly. What was he like? He knew the repertoire very well and he specialised in English composers and um, I think he brought a cohesion and uh, a great feeling of ensemble and... Um, he raised the standard of the orchestra over that seven-year period. There's no doubt about that. Mm, yes. Mm. It, um, and everyone was really excited to get him. He had been the um, assistant conductor and the concert master of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, but when Goosens arrived there, he was squeezed out and he came to Brisbane. And uh, the ABC was really excited about it. Uh, E.J. McCann, who was the Brisbane manager, who, or Queensland manager, who succeeded Huck Finlay, wrote, I'm confident that under the direction of this fine musician, the future of the orchestra and the development of music in this state is assured, and I'm sure that the establishment of the orchestra will bring fame and glory to the state and to those responsible for their wisdom in making such a valuable con contribution to the cultural progress of Queensland. One of the, um, one of the first leaders of the Queensland Orchestra, I hear a, a, a gasp of recognition, <laughs> was George White. George White was mm. a bit of a legend, wasn't he? Pam, did, you, did you know George White? Uh, yes, uh, um, he was leading for some mm. of the performances that I played and he was a very nice person. Mm. Um, I didn't know him really closely, but just uh, as soloist, of course, um, when I was with the orchestra. Mm. He would have been a leader when you were there, Patrick, wouldn't he? Certainly. Certainly. But he was the leader of the second state spring quartet hmm. previous to his becoming concert master in 1952. That's right. That's right. He was already well known. And, uh, Absolutely. Queensland was the first, or, uh, first state to establish a permanent string quartet, the Queensland State String Quartet. And as Patrick says, George White was a member. Another regular visitor was Joseph Post, um, who can also conducted in that first season. Um, Patrick, he was the guy. That, he was actually the conductor who discovered you, wasn't he? In a kind of a way. <laughs> I'd been pestering Joe for, for years to give me an audition because, uh, anyway, he gave me part of his rehearsal, and he, and he sent the orchestra home after I'd sweated profusely for a, a, an hour or so, and he said, uh, Patrick, there are two things you've got to remember. The first is you work too hard. All conductors work too hard. And for Christ's sake, keep your bum in. Don't crouch and bend over the orchestra. <laughs> I've never read that in a textbook. <laughs> he's, a very good, he's a very good man. One of the other conductors who, play, who conducted in that first season was Warwick Braithwaite. Some of you may know the conductor Nick Braithwaite, Nicholas Braithwaite, who's been coming to Queensland for the, oh, oh, many, many years now, well over a decade, and uh, Adelaide-based conductor now uh, of English uh, birth. When Braithwaite was here for that third subscription concert, he played here and he conducted here in May 1947 and he sent a telegram back to head office, ABC head office as it was called then, and the telegram read, Brisbane Orchestra extremely good, very happy, regards Braithwaite. It was a real landmark for the Queensland, Queensland Orchestra and Subsequently, he wrote a report on his tour, as most of the conductors, visiting conductors, did. And one of the players who he singled out for special prose was the 15-year-old flautist Patrick Thomas. So. <laughs> um, there's a story about about you and Warwick Braithwaite, isn't there? Uh, 
conducting the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra probably in the uh, late 70s or early 80s, I stayed at the Hotel Australia in Col Collins Street. Nick Braithwaite had been with them, and I followed him the next day. He was out working with them that evening. I was settling in. And I thought, gee, I played under Warwick, you know, 30 years ago. I must write to Nick and say hi. And um, I left a note under his door, and he wrote back and said, gee, it was nice to have this note, Patrick. You know, you played under my father, but I never had the privilege of doing so. And I thought that was, there's a touch mm. of irony there. Yes, yes. It's quite sad, really, isn't it? Mm. Yes, as well. Queensland had something that was unique, though, with symphony orchestras. We had this. Right from the outset, indeed through its very constitution as a state-funded organisation, the orchestra had regional touring on its mind. Just 11 weeks after its formation and barely two months after its, its concert debut, the Queensland Symphony Orchestra hit the train tracks for the first time, headed north. First regional concert they ever played was in Maryborough. They hated it. <laughs> Maryborough became a problem for the orchestra for a number of years. They then went on to Bundaberg the next night. It's not a problem now, I hasten to add. It was just early on. And then they went to Rockhampton. The soloist was the bass, Stanley Clarkson. The conductor was John Farnsworth Hall. Later that year, they were at it again. They went off to Toowoomba, where 2,500 school children packed into the Empire Theatre, and they went to Warwick, where they were very disappointed with an audience of 471 people attending in Warwick. I'd be, I'd be thrilled with 471 <laughs> attending, <laughs> attending today. Um, and from then on, it really was, a, was, was part of the life and soul, this, this uh, touring. Uh, you can see here, this was, a, this was a tour, I think, in the late... Would that be in the late 50s, Rodney, do you reckon, by the look of that, when you joined the orchestra around that time? Yes. The thing about this orchestra was it was the longest land-based symphony orchestra tour in the world. It lasted for three weeks, <laughs> going all the way up to Cairns. On a couple of occasions, they went out to Western Queensland as well. The orchestra lived on the train. Someone, so, you know, you had to make do <laughs> as, be, as best you could. Quite trying conditions. Pam, you went on, I think, four northern tours as solo. Just something like that, yes. Now, this photograph, you can, probably can't see it. I should have had a, a screen for you guys so you don't have to crane your necks. <laughs> this photograph is at Townsville oh. train, uh, Station. <laughs> You played in Townsville, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes, I on did. On one of these northern tours. What yes. happened? Well, I remember Townsville because um, it was terribly hot. I think this was about September and um, that I always like to have a little bit of a rest in the afternoon before playing a concert. So I thought uh, I'll get in the train and have a nice afternoon siesta. Oh, well, another train came in on the other side of the station and the smell was just dreadful. It was a, a cattle train. And I thought, oh, I can't stay here and have a sleep. So I got up and went shopping. Found a very nice dress shop and did some shopping. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget Townsville. <laughs> the fact that Pam mentions a dress shop is not insignificant. Um, <laughs> Pamela actually revolutionised fashion on the Queensland concert stage. <laughs> Um, I think some of the outfits which she introduced to Queensland concert stages included a, a mini skirt. You were the first. Oh yes. Well, first. actually, on that first tour, I think mm. there was 67. Um, no, knowing, know that, knowing that I was going on the train, I had to think now, what will I take for clothes to wear? And I thought I was being very clever. It was just the time of the mini, but of course, the mini's not like today. It was here jean shrimped and just above the knee. So I thought, oh, I'll get one made. So I got one made. And everything was fine till I got to Rockhampton. And everyone was quite disgusted to think that she would wear a mini on stage. <laughs> and the mayor, Pil Pilbeam, Pilbeam, yes, yes, he seemed to quite like the idea of it. <laughs> but when I went... <laughs> I went on another tour in, um, oh, it might have been another 10 years later on another tour, um, they were still talking about the, the mini. <laughs> Could you believe it? But I thought I was being very practical, actually. And uh, harem pants, I think, as well. Oh, yes, I wore harem and, uh... pants at one stage. Yes, I wore collots, mini, boots, all sorts of diff different things at the time. And another time yeah. that was quite, quite... Um, unusual and dis disgusting was when Max and Dean and myself played... Dean the is Dean Olding, co <laughs> co-concert master of the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, who was the son of Max and Pamela. 
And we were, it was being televised. We were playing the Mozart three piano concerto. So I was thinking, oh, well, Max and Dean will get a black velvet jerkin made for them and they can wear white um, shirts and things. And I thought, well, I'll be sitting in the middle. And I had a very nice pair of, of crepe slacks with a lace top. And I thought that would be very nice. Well, someone was telling me afterwards they were hearing a lot of whispers up in the City Hall gallery. She was wearing slacks on stage. <laughs> Unforgivable. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is, this is in the 70s, yeah. of course, but I thought we were being very practical. Pamela's performances were always memorable, and this, this was brought home to me just last Saturday night. In fact, when I had the privilege of attending the final of the Sydney International Piano Competition um, at the Opera House with, with Max and Pamela. And at that event someone remembered a performance that you gave. Yes, a lady came up to me and she said, I hope you don't mind my recognising you, but she said, um, that was after someone had just played the Emperor Concerto, mm. but she said, I remember your playing of the, Mendel of the Emperor Concerto in Brisbane 40 years ago. <laughs> and, and she even remembered our three piano Mozart too. And then I was trying to think afterwards, whatever would that have been? And then there was a Beethoven series at that stage with um, Bernard Hines conducting and I played the Empress, so that must have been the concert. But that was very nice of her. Because Pam did so many of these northern tours, she experienced all manner of things because, of course, there are really practical issues about touring an orchestra. One, for instance, is where are they going to play? Quite regularly, the orchestra couldn't play with its full complement because they could, all couldn't fit on the, not all of them could fit on the stage. In the, in the venues in, in which they performed. Other times there weren't suitable pianos available. Improvisation was the key. Yes, you had to improvise a few times, <laughs> not at the keyboard, or I mean to get to the keyboard, <laughs> didn't you? Yeah, well, Maryborough, um, they had to arrange a separate little stage sort of in front of the orchestra, and someone had lent them a, um, a um, baby grand, Beckstein, can you imagine? I was going to play the Tchaikovsky Concerto. I couldn't believe it <laughs> when I saw this baby grand. You know, blom, chom, chom. Tchaik Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto has, has, has some of the most celebrated power chords in the whole of classical music. On a baby grand, it's a bit like playing it on Schroeder's piano. <laughs> and another time I was nearly forgotten. I think it might have been Cairns, and I can't think which tour it was. It might have been the second tour, and I was standing on the railway station... Uh, waiting and waiting, because everyone had gone, the orchestra, they were starting at 8 o'clock, and then I was thinking, goodness me, they're taking a long time, and the guard of the train, I said to me, nobody's, nobody's come, and so he rang the hall, and Peter was so busy counting all the money, he suddenly realised that I wasn't there, <laughs> so <laughs> had to hot foot her down and get me, so uh, that was another funny experience. <laughs> there were a number of occasions of musicians getting left behind and having to hire taxis to chase after the train and, <laughs> and doing the cowboy mount on the train. <laughs> so, so you'd never get away with it now, I think, with, with <laughs> OH&S regulations. On that first major tour, their, their first really major tour was in 1948, and the soloist on that tour was Harold Blair, the Indigenous tenor, who became such a celebrity um, in, in Australia. And he was an absolute delight uh, on, on the tour. All the newspapers covered him. He was media. He was he was just a fabulous media performer. He'd been a uh, he'd, he'd been a farm labourer, and he knew how to drive heavy machinery. And uh, on one occasion, I think it was in uh, in Gladstone, uh, with the media assembled, he jumped in the train and actually started driving the train. And the media covered it. There were all these kinds of antics that uh, that played out on stage. I think it was also on that that first major tour in town when a minor bird got into the, uh, the, got into the hall and uh, one, of the, one of the wind section, who was actually the captain of the, of the uh, orchestra's cricket team, actually managed to pluck it by hand from the air <laughs> and remove it and it, was, and it got the biggest, biggest round of applause of the night. But, <laughs> but as time went on, this tour became, became legendary. In 1958, Time magazine sent one of their American correspondents to Australia to cover the Queensland Symphony Orchestra's tour. It was of such interest. There was an article in Time magazine about it. They got all the facts wrong. It's one of the shoddiest pieces of journalism you can ever imagine, but, uh, but it was still amazing that, that they would go to those lengths. Patrick, how many tours did you do? Can you remember? Uh, four as a player and four as a conductor. What was the experience like? Did you like touring or was it a bit of an ordeal living in those cramped conditions for three weeks? Well, it weeks? wasn't exactly five-star accommodation. 
queuing for toilet and shower facilities on railway platforms, for instance, you know? <laughs> but it, it, uh, the Northern Two was benign, as far as I was concerned. One, can I just mm. mention one? Yes. They did a, you were mentioning Warwick and Toowoomba. On one such occasion, some of us in Warwick went down to have a, um, a sandwich before the concert performance. Mm. And uh, from that point, everything started to go wrong. <laughs> Don Scotts was one of them. Still washing his clothes. That's, that's Don Scotts, assistant um, concert master, washing his clothes in Townsville. We went down to what was called the ABC Cafe in the main street of Warwick. This is a true story. And from that point, as I say, things started to go wrong. I got through the first half of the program satisfactorily, but the stomach was churning. And uh, the interval came and nothing happened. It never does in the interval. I went back on stage and we had the Borodin B minor symphony on our stands. And in, that, in those days, there were only two regular flute players, Jimmy Carson and myself. And I, I had no alternative but to leave the, the platform. It was the unforgivable. I had to go. And I left Jimmy Carson there. You didn't go for quicker tempi? Well, I <laughs> tried to signal John Farns with all, but it's a bit difficult when you're playing a piccolo. And um, Jim Carson was probably wishing that he'd learned to triple stop on the flute because there are three flute parts there. I went to John Farns with all at the end. I, had a, I went to him and I said, look, uh, Mr Hall, I'm very sorry for what happened. It was... It was really upsetting me in more ways than once still then. And he said, you really should look after yourself on these tours. <laughs> no sympathy there. No. <laughs> anyway, a bit later that night, on the way back to Toowoomba, a number of other players had eaten at the same cafe. It was food poisoning. And John Farnsworth Hall succumbed. So our next conversation was far friendlier. <laughs> this uh, the old recognise some of the players here. Um, Paul Rawson is there, who's currently still currently a member of the Queensland Orchestra. Craig Cunningham, who until recently was uh, principal tuba of the orchestra. This is a more modern, but you know, this is another example of improvisation on the tours. But one of the things that um, one of the things that happens with symphony orchestras is that you do need to keep refreshing your chief conductor. And by the mid 1950s. John Farnsworth Hall had been here for quite some time. The ABC felt and the players felt that it was probably time for him to move on to new challenges. Similarly in Western Australia, the West Australian Symphony Orchestra was feeling a bit the same way about their chief conductor, uh, Rudolf Pekarik. So the deal was done where West Australian Symphony Orchestra and Queensland Symphony Orchestra swapped conductors. And the man in the middle there pointing to the Queensland map is Rudolf Pekarik, who became the second chief conductor of the Queensland, of the Queensland Orchestra. Um, Bakarik had been born in 1900 uh, in the great musical city of Prague and he had an impeccable musical uh, pedigree. He'd, he'd studied conducting under Jan Kubelik, who was the, the father of Raphael Kubelik. He'd formed the Film, Opera and Concert Orchestra in Prague, which subsequently became the Prague Symphony. And he did this in an effort to help depression era musicians who were, who were out of work. And it, it was an activity which even today makes him a legendary figure in the, in the symphonic history of Prague. Look up any musical history of Prague and you'll see Pekarik's name there, there in lights. He was a short, he was a stocky man and he emigrated to Australia with his wife but he'd, he too had endured wartime atrocities. Um, he'd actually been a prisoner of the Nazis in a, in, in a camp near Auschwitz and uh, he, and, he and his wife Terry had been separated uh, for many years by by a concrete wall, and uh, for years they would greet each other in the morning over the wall by whistling over the razor wire by whistling the um, the opening of Vorjak's New World Symphony. That was their code to uh, communicate with each other for for years. And on one occasion during the war, he actually escaped. It was in 1944, and he escaped to join the Czech Liberation. Of, um, forces, and, um, but he was captured and he was actually called up into a lineup of prisoners by the Nazi guards who went along the line progressively shooting people and um, they, they stopped at the, at the person before Pekarik. Uh, he was terribly scarred by, by this experience as of course you can imagine he would be and um, the trauma. He still had the Nazi tattoo on his, on his arm um, and he was a fairly um, understandably a fairly prickly character um, at times. Um, one of the things about him, though, was that 
he had this fantastic music library. And in post-war Australia, that music library was like gold because there were so many privations. And uh, for many years, that library became a staple of ABC concerts all around, all around the country. He was to be here for 13 years, and people like Rodney Jacobson uh, were to play under him. And um, he was, um, here he is with, that's a young James Christensen. Does everyone remember, know James Christensen? A wonderful chorus master, a former Absolutely. chorus master of Opera Queensland. Great baritone, of course. Still living here at St Lucia. Um, that's him with, with Bacarek there, and that's Bacarek with his orchestra. As I say, Bacarek was here for 13 years, from 1954 onwards. One of his first concerts, he actually... Um, <laughs> the audience consisted largely of bodgies and widgies. Do you remember bodgies and widgies? <laughs> it was a wet day and uh, they were taking shelter and they stumbled into Brisbane City Hall. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the, the Courier Mail was, was there and uh, they interviewed these, these bodgies and widgies. And um, one, of them, uh, one of the teens told the reporter, I like jazz, it makes me want to dance, but this stuff gets you deep down inside. And that was the orchestra, <laughs> that was Picaric's orchestra, it was 54 players at that time. The orchestra was always struggling for money. Even within their first few months of existence, they had to lay off eight players. Effectively, that was ten, because there were two, role, two, two roles vacant at that time. And there was a huge hue and cry about the need to cut back on players, but the ABC were great. Within, within a year, they reinstated those players once the financial crisis was over. But the orchestra always struggled financially. But there's no question, during his 13 years... Um, Pekarik left the orchestra as probably a better orchestra than he, than he found it. One of the problems he had when, when he came to the orchestra in the mid-1950s was that a lot of players were leaving. They were going to better jobs, and Patrick was one who actually left the orchestra um, around that time. But Pekarik did a very good job. Um, Pam, when you came to Queensland, uh, you and Max came 1961, 1962. Mm. That was the Pekarik era. Yes. What were your first impressions of Queensland music making? when you first arrived from Melbourne? Well, we arrived at the end of 61 for Max to start teaching at the Conservatorium in 1962. And we'd been quite busy, of course, in, um, in Melbourne. And uh, we decided to go to the ABC and meet Alan McChrystal just to sort of let him know that we were here. Who, the, the orchestra was, or music was effectively run, the orchestra was effectively run from Sydney by the ABC, but there were state managers, mm, state managers. for music, and Alan McChrystal was the Queensland one. So we went in to, to meet Alan, who's sitting back on the chair and his feet up on the, on the desk in front of him, and he said to us, oh, it's wonderful to have you both in, in Queensland. And so we were thinking, oh, great, it'll be a nice lot of work to do. Well, 62 came, and then finally, towards the end of 1963, we um, were asked to play the Mozart to Piano Concerto with Dean Dixon conducting, so that was a thrill. And then in 1964, Max gave the first, um, uh, first performance of the Prokofiev Second Concerto, so that was something. Mm. And then there was a, a little bit of a gap before things started to move on for me as a soloist. And uh, I was doing Partyland, the ABC children's session Partyland from about 63 to 66. I was going to ask, how does a classically trained pianist end up presenting a children's <laughs> show? <laughs> well, it's just that it, everything was rather quiet for me at the time. And uh, this was announced in the paper. They wanted someone. And I thought, oh, that could be fun. And Max said, you should go and audition for that. So um, uh, I did. And uh, there were about 200 people, and, and I was just so thrilled that I got it because uh, it, it was just something different and acting. I liked the stage and, and that type of thing. And um, so that sort of gave me an interest. But then gradually, during that time, I think people realised, well, I was here. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, of course, I got um, quite regular performances. Did you work with Bakarik? Yes, I did. I played with him a couple of times. Um, very nice man. A uh, little bit slow to get going, I suppose, because being younger, I was sort of wanting faster tempi or what have you. But um, yes, I, I played with him. <laughs> this is actually a question without notice, but one of the people who played most with Pekarik was Rodney Jacobson, the principal clarinet. Rodney, I don't know whether you wanted to say a brief word. I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. This is completely <laughs> un unprobably. Would you mind? 
<laughs> Rodney Jacobson was principal clarinet of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra and um, then subsequently general manager uh, with conspicuous success in the late 1990s. Rodney, what are your recollections of Pekarik? Well, my, rec my recollection is that uh, Rudy gave him my first chance and uh, uh, he'd come to a concert at the Queensland Conservatorium in those days in Belcher Street and I uh, did a performance of Shepherd on the Rock with Janet Delpratt. And the next um, day, uh, Bert Shepherd, who was the orchestral manager, rang up and said uh, that uh, Miss McCarrick wanted to see me. And cut a long story short, I uh, played second clarinet in the Mahler Fourth Symphony. So that was my introduction to orchestral and playing. And what an introduction! A young start. clarinet player having to play Mahler, who, of course, you know, was not the con composer that he is now. Of course, now we all all go Mahler, Mahler, but. Uh, <laughs> Back then, that would have been the first time it would have been played in Queensland, wouldn't it? I suppose it was, and, you know, people were shocked that we were playing such avant-garde music in those days. <laughs> yes. and, uh, yes. Rudy himself uh, had a wide range of interests, and in those days in the ABC, we used to do a lot more adventurous programs than currently they do. And yes. uh, um, Many composers, uh, well, Hans Werner Henze, I remember Rudy conducting a, one of his symphonies, which is quite a... Uh, Unusual choice for a person like Rudy. And uh, yes. he was, um, when, when things got complex rhythmically, Rudy was left far behind. And was, the comment was he used to conduct in circles. So <laughs> anywhere in the circle, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> was where the beat was. Yes. It's said about a lot of conductors that they conduct in circles. I'm afraid Bernard Hines was another one who was regarded as a conductor who conducted in circles. I have heard one recently, actually, uh, of a conductor who, um, I'm told musicians actually don't follow, don't follow the beat at all. They follow his elbow, because <laughs> the elbow is more accurate than the... <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Rodney. That was a question without notice. I won't put you on the spot again. <laughs> um, we, need to, we need to move this along, because I think it's 7... Is it 7.15, Kate? And we need to finish this at 7.30, is that correct? Yes, OK. We'll, we'll move this on. Uh, the next chief conductor was very young, as you can see. Um, no, in fact it wasn't. <laughs> the school's concerts were always a vital part of, of the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. In fact, they, um, the very first year they existed, they started playing school's concerts. The person who succeeded Pekarik briefly was Stanford Robinson, an English conductor. Pam, you played with Stanford yes. Robinson. Yes, I, I played with him for the, um, the first tour, train tour that, that I went on. And also he conducted some of the um, gala performances um, and for television, yes. Okay. I played with him. What, can you remember what you played? List E-flat concerto was the one on the first tour. First tour. Yes. Mm -hmm. he, wasn't here for too, he wasn't here for too long, um, Stanford Robinson. He was, a, he was regarded as a bit of a light music, light music specialist. Um, and I think the, um, every Wednesday morning, I think, Rodney, didn't they, they, they would do a live broadcast around the nation of light music from Queensland. It was another thing that put, helped to put the Queensland Symphony Orchestra on the map. Incidentally, the singer there getting the ovation from the uh, small girl is Stefania Wojtovic, a, a Polish soprano. Back in those days, the tours used to be absolutely mammoth. Stefania Wojtovic sang 61 concerts on that tour in, 1960, in 1966. Mm. Wow. Um, it really did take its toll on her, but uh, it was not uncommon. The young Daniel Barenboim, Played uh, when he was 19, he played a uh, 61 concert tour of Australia as well. Um, went right throughout Queensland, and that, in fact, was his second tour. He'd played a 45 concert tour in, back, in, uh, back when he was a 15 year old. And to this day, he maintains that he learnt to be a recitalist in Australia and in regional Queensland. He had a favourite fish and chip shop in, um, <laughs> in uh, Mackay, and uh, apparently, one, uh, one night he. Um, he was, um, he was starting the second half, I think it was a Schubert Sonata, he was starting the second half and he had to stop because his fingers were still greasy from the fish and chips he'd eaten at interval from the greasy spoon across the, across the way. Um, Ashkenazi also played uh, up in, up in uh, the, north, the north of Queensland uh, in 1970. Outdoor concerts, Queensland Symphony Orchestra was the first, concert, the first orchestra in Australia to venture outdoors. Uh, Sydney and Adelaide followed within weeks or months after them, but in, in uh, 1949 they played outdoors for the first time. Our climate, of course, was ideally suited to it. Uh, I'm going to just jump ahead um, a bit 
because after Stanford Robinson, an orchestra in many ways is characterised by the personality of their chief conductor. This is why I tend to dwell on the chief conductors. Getting onto the train to head north is Ezra Racklin. Ezra Racklin was a, um, an American. He'd been a pupil of Fritz Reiner, that great kind of legendary American conductor who was known as a bit of a tyrant. Pam, you played under Ezra yeah. Racklin, yes, who I, was I, here from 70 to 72. Was he a tyrant? Um, no, he was very nice. I found him very nice. I did the um, uh, Rachmaninoff C minor with him the first time, and then I think I played the Mendelssohn with him some time as well. But I, I found him very easy. There was no problem. It was just so easy. He knew it, and I knew my part, and we just gelled. I really enjoyed mm. those performances with Ezra. Yes. He was here from 1970 to 1972, and he made a... He made a huge impact while he was here. And as you can see, he's on the Northern Tour there. But then, when Ezra left in 1972, it was time to get a homegrown fellow into the role. <laughs> <laughs> and there he is. Patrick, who are these people? Do you know? I don't know who these people are. That's you on the left, obviously. Robert Carbo at the back. Mm -hmm. Who was he? He was the uh, uh, grade three... Uh, yeah, well, he was the senior producer, music producer. Yes. Very fine, very cultivated, very sensitive. Yes. Does anyone else know who these other two are? It's probably hard for you to see from there, Patrick. I haven't shown this to you previously. Oh, gosh. Uh, but anyway, that is Patrick, and this is Patrick with his orchestra, 1973 through to 1977. And this was my favourite uh, time for the Queensland Orchestra. And in fact, it was the time when I fell in love with orchestral music. It was also the time, because I, I personally was um, torn between becoming a professional cricketer um, and becoming someone who worked in music. And I realised I was going to become a musician when one afternoon in Nambour, I was on 97 Not Out, and, um, in a, in a match, and the last bus to Brisbane for a QSO concert that night left at, a, at a 5 o'clock. It was a quarter to 5, and I had a long way to walk to the station. So I ran myself out <laughs> so I could make the bus to go to one of Patrick's concerts. Great um, love have, hath no man. <laughs> <laughs> so I entirely blame my lack of success as a cricketer in future years to Patrick, Patrick Thomas. These were exciting times, Patrick. How do you remember your years as, as chief conductor of the Queensland Orchestra? It was a bit formidable going back to what was my old orchestra. But uh, I think it was... Uh, a great, great period of... Uh, we did a lot of contemporary works that had been fairly low on the Richter scale in previous uh, years with the orchestra. And it, I think it honed its technique to a certain degree. There were concertos available for players of the orchestra who wished to do them. There were lots of things. There was a television series that's never been uh, replicated in any way. Music Wherever You Go, ten programs, educational programs... Um, things of that kind. I remember in particular the concerts uh, that were done at Main Hall oh, featuring yes. composers whose names we just were completely unfamiliar with. Um, Fibic and Harvel and all manner of, of <laughs> contemporary composers. Um, it was an extraordinary time to be, in, to be in Brisbane. Sure. The Modern Music Forum, I think, mm. served its cause very well. And there were Schoenberg and Berg and... Um, uh, Takamitsu and a lot of, lot of other modern composers who, whose works were given uh, ventilation, if I can put it that way, in those concerts. It is funny, isn't it, that, we, that as, as um, Rodney was just saying, that, that you know, it would be hard to get some of these works on now. In, in, a, sure. in, in a way, we've almost Absolutely. gone backwards in terms of our, mm. uh, of our programming, or at least in terms of our daring mm. where, programming, where programming is concerned. Um, Patrick was, uh, was here, as I say, between 1973 and 1977 and then went on to become conductor-in-residence with the ABC because one of the famous things about Patrick is that he was able to step in at a moment's notice to fill in when, there were, when conductors were suddenly indisposed or unable to complete engagements. And you became known as a conductor who knew how to study schools on an aeroplane. Oh, didn't you? <laughs> did, did that quite a bit, actually. Yes. yes, quite a bit. You mentioned it was a bit hard coming back as a former player. Well, they treated could you take me us through what, you, could you, what, what are the issues involved in that? Well, it's, it's, it's human relationships and all that, and I, I kept myself a bit distant. You have to do that sort of thing, even whatever emotions you have for people in the orchestra, whatever emotions. You have to be fair, and you have to take sometimes 
uh, decisions that are difficult, as you, you would know yourself as an administrator. But mm. um, I, they treated me so well. I have nothing but the greatest and the fondest memories of that uh, group. Yes. When we leave tonight, I'll play a little bit of... Um, and, Dave, if you're listening, I'll get you to play a little bit of the uh, Talos Fantasia oh. conducted by, by Patrick with the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. Um, it's still being reissued on ABC Classics. In fact, the version we're playing now comes off a, off a CD that has only just been released. And, in fact, on that CD are three separate tracks of Patrick Thomas and the Queensland Symphony Orchestra. So, you know, those tracks are now, you know, 30 or or more years old and they're coming out. And, in fact, when you see the ad on ABC TV over the coming weeks for a product called Dads Love Classics, a Father's Day campaign, three of those tracks on there are actually Queensland Symphony Orchestra tracks from the time of Patrick's chief conductorship. Yeah, so, you know, the legacy lives on. and, um, And next year, ABC Classics will be releasing... Patrick Thomas retrospective in its Australian Masters uh, series. So look out, look out for that, and there'll be lots of Queensland Symphony Orchestra uh, featured there. Um, we are running out of time, and I really wanted to g- give you a chance to ask questions um, as well. I just want to dash through those who came after. I really wanted to finish this at 1977 in any case, but um, that was Vancho Chavdarsky, and one of the things Vancho did was to conduct um, concerts for, um, for disabled people. Um, and there's, there's an example of that there. There's a familiar face, the wonderful Werner Andreas Albert, dear Werner, who still, who still spends up to six months a year in Brisbane. Such a wonderful man, such a wonderful conductor who did so much, not just for the Queensland Symphony Orchestra, but also for the Queensland Theatre Orchestra, come Queensland Philharmonic uh, Orchestra, and still conducts, of course, with the Queensland Orchestra. Um, and that brings us to the end of that part of the, present, of the presentation. We do... I think that clock is five minutes fast, Kate, doesn't it? So um, we do have five minutes to take audience questions. Does anyone have any questions of, of Patrick or of Pamela? Don't be shy. <laughs> I've got plenty if we need to cover. But that's a, yes. Yes. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there were some famous examples because there, there was air conditioning in, in uh, Brisbane City Hall of a kind uh, as well, but uh, quite regularly they left the doors open anyway. And there were, there were some summer concerts where the temperature got over 100 degrees during the, during the concerts. <laughs> so, yes, we're very spoiled. We're very spoiled these days. But the amazing thing about these musicians is that they, you know, that they could perform under those conditions. And I think it inspired other people as well. One of my favourite stories of endurance was, um, was actually of Sir Bernard Hines, who, who conducted several northern tours. But he, conducted, he, he took one of the northern tours when he was 82 years old. And he lived on that train on the northern tour when, when he was 82 years old and never once complained. Never once complained. He knew what it was about. He knew what it took. And I suppose Sir Bernard, by that stage, had been taking trains around Australia for 60 years. Um, so, you know, he knew what he was in for. And, uh, but Tony Gould, uh, who most of you know was you know, the, very, the, the former uh, general manager of, of QPAC, CEO of, of QPAC, um, before he took on that role, was actually an ABC employee. And, and he, he worked for the orchestra and he managed some of those tours. And he said he, always, he, he was always impressed about... Sir Bernard because of that tour. He was the person who was administering that tour. Did Tony was very forward-looking as mm-hmm. concert manager of the QSO, and I, I count myself very, very fortunate that he was in charge of concerts when I was in my first three years yes. with the QSO. Yes. Well, look, that, um, that more or less wraps us up um, here uh, for now. The, the research that I've been, I've been referring to here, it's part of my uh, John Oxley Library Fellowship. And I'd just like to acknowledge the John Oxley Library. This is an incredible opportunity for anyone with a love of music and specifically a love of Queensland music to research into this field. It's 
amazing just the material that is available uh, in this library and elsewhere around, around the country. Some of it you can access online as we accessed uh, the R.T. Jeffries anthem online through uh, Music Queensland. You can also access some of these pictures through Picture Queensland. Um, the fruits of my research, I hope, are going to um, come out either late next year or early the year after, uh, and it'll be a book about the entire history of Queensland music making, and, um, or at least from the arrival of R.T. Jeffries in 1871. So I'm very excited about that, and I'm just really excited to have the opportunity. It this book would not have happened without the support of, of State Library, nor would it have happened without the support of my informants, who are sitting here <laughs> beside me, Pamela, uh, Pamela Page, Patrick Thomas, and so many others. But for the moment, could you please thank Patrick and Pamela? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll, and I'll now, hand, now hand you back to Kate. Thank you. Can you please join with me? We really would like to thank um, Martin Buzzacott for giving us such a um, great insight into his research and, and we all look forward to your book, Martin. So thank you so much. And, and thank you so much um, to Patrick and Pamela, particularly thank you, Patrick, for, for joining us, for coming up to Brisbane and thank you, Pamela, for joining us tonight too. Um, just a few quick things. If you enjoyed tonight's talk, we, we have um, similar talks um, all throughout the year. So please sign up to our What's On Outside or take one of our What's On brochures. Um, we have a, a, a coming up in the next fortnight is uh, John Bell in Conversation, which will be a fantastic talk. Michael Gow will be interviewing John. Um, that's on the 20th of August. And there's many great talks that we do throughout the year. Um, and also, um, we really like getting your feedback as well. So there's feedback forms out, outside. If there's anything that you, you'd like to let us know, please fill in a form. And as Martin mentioned, um, for those interested in our collections, the heritage and the music collections, please come in during opening hours and talk to our very knowledgeable and helpful librarians or, um, or go on the website as well. So thank you all very much for coming, and um, thank you. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you.